<clears throat> get knowledge here, right? Can you hear me? Thank you very much, David, for the very kind words and the jokes about Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> Be aware, I will make uh, some jokes eventually. Um, <laughs> if I don't, then uh, remind me later on. <coughs> now, uh, I'll try to put down a somewhat, somewhat uh, provocative title, which should. <coughs> We should uh, point at something that is new and we should point at something that eventually uh, is a nice research topic. It's, it's uh, actually very near to the research topic of that phantom of the canton. Um, why not the chemical microprocessor and what kind of uh, idea comes up if we hear the word microprocessor? Um, everybody thinks about computers. What should chemists do with computers? Um, what should micro do in that whole thing? And uh, I've heard a sentence recently um, which said, whatever needs to be big will remain big, but all the rest will become very small because there's no need for things to be big. Now, let's go a little bit across that. If we look at typical length of different animals actually or organisms an elephant a phantom of the canton and other human beings could be uh, head of department <laughs> um, uh, this is the publication generator this is a mosquito and this is a bacterium and um, I've put down the ratio of their length. So the, the reason to have a certain size in our case is that we have a certain <coughs> body size, or we, our fingers have a certain size, and we ought to manipulate. If we look at other proportionalities which play a role and which become more drastic at the end, if you look at typical volumes, then the ratios would be very dramatic. So big organisms uh, would be 125 times bigger than a human body eventually, whereas a bacterium is really very small. I mean, here I don't dare to say this would be a head part. <laughs> Rather, in this area up there. So uh, <clears throat> there is proportionalities in nature. And because we ourselves interact with what we try to handle, um, we have to quickly look at this. If we look at how we look, uh, if we look at an object, then we will find that an object smaller than a centimeter feels small, and smaller than a centimeter is basically smaller than the width of a finger. So it is clearly linked to our size. Would we be a bacterium? We would think, we would think this is very big. And larger than 10 meters is big. Uh, this is, seems, seems uh, quite trivial. If we go into the time scale, we find that there is something very similar there. Something, one single event, smaller than 100 milliseconds, feels immediate. And something happening in one minute feels very slow. So, for example, uh, this talk may be very slow. <laughs> um, if we now change this time scale by a factor 100, if we go for one single event from 100 millisecond to 1 millisecond, this is not impressive because it was immediate, it is still immediate. So this factor 100 is not relevant for us. If we go from 17 hours to 10 minutes, this makes a difference, but it's not so striking because it's always long, it's on the long side of our perception. Whereas if we make the factor 100 from 10 minutes to 6 seconds, we basically run from one side to the other. And this is a very, very relevant time scale that we have to be aware of. Now, let's go back to uh, my favorite sentence. Uh, I don't have to read it again, should I? Can you read it in the back? Um, there is a number of objects that have a reason to be big. For example, a windmill needs a certain amount of energy. 
Here, this is linked to the body size of a human. This is eventually linked to the size of the river. Otherwise, uh, car drivers would have a problem at the end. <laughs> the, violin, the size of the violin is linked to the, to the tone levels that we wanted to achieve. But there is definitely objects. There is objects that are um, eventually too big. This is a microphone relatively big microphone, this is an old telephone. It's a very big thing. So it could, I mean, if you compare such a box, I don't know how big it was with today's modern telephones, it should be fine. If you look at my watch here and compare it to uh, something that they found nearby, <laughs> then you will find there is no reason to be so big. It's just uh, basically to be impressive it is so big, but Physically, you could read time from a smaller watch eventually. And um, so, basically, my prediction whatever needs to be big will remain big. Let's have a look at microprocessors in other areas. Uh, the most developed microprocessor area is definitely microelectronics. Um, there is a comment, those who can read it this way. This is basically the Pentium microprocessor, very nicely in, in its color, and you see a very, very high degree of integration. It looks like a city. There is other microsystems or microprocessor, and I'll just choose one, an optical one. This is a Michelson interferometer that has been presented a month ago in a Japanese conference, and it includes a laser diet it includes the whole optical pathways, it includes uh, two photodiodes, monitor photodiodes, and it would basically analyze the length here. And the entire system is only 2 by 1.6 millimeters in size. And it's an independent system that uh, is as independent as a Pentium microprocessor. And uh, I know that there is loads of friends of the chemistry department and of other Chemistry, chemistry labs in here, and uh, we all may ask the question, where is chemistry? I know where chemistry is. Chemistry is in the old Philip lab, Philip's lab, and what I found there is a box that says Ilford, no, uh, no year on it. But basically, I found these old slides. It's very big slides, actually. And this side, I couldn't project it in any other ways. But if you look at these kind of objects here, they look like uh, basically the reaction vessels that were used a hundred years ago. There's not much integration now. So is this really where chemistry ought to be and what is the role of uh, miniaturization in chemistry? This should be today's topic. And I would like to show you a couple of experiments now that uh, basically uh, date back to my of experiences when I was a boy. Every chemist has a reason why he studied chemistry and uh, I have some volunteers that eventually would help me setting the whole thing up. The first thing I would show you is that if we have a reaction with big materials it would go slower than if we have fine powdered materials you see a difference in reactivity, which is very well known. It's kind of trivial. The molecule as such is our measure. The molecule is very small, so even the finest powder would include loads of uh, molecules. And actually, we, should, we will show the oxidation of magnesium. Well known, not very difficult. Um, first of all, we will have a about what is it, five inch long band of magnesium. And you will see how that oxidizes when we heat it up in a flame. So it, it, it basically burns down very slow, relatively slowly, but steadily. I hope we won't have to buy a fine thing in the next moment, and if we do, then we see how quickly uh, the organizers of this meeting can react. <laughs> <laughs> because we can't extinguish it. We have to live with it. We have to wait until it's over. As a second step, what we will do is we have some 
magnesium powder all over there, which is supposed to be smaller in size. And uh, we didn't dare to take the finest powder because we, want, we, we wanted to, to, to live on in this institution here. But the, as you see, it reacts readily, like it reacts a lot faster than the one before. So we have an almost immediate reaction. I mean, small volumes could mean faster speed there. Thank you. Uh, we, we do have a second demonstration, and this demonstration is supposed to be transmitted using our little trick here. And, um, yeah. So basically what you will see is a big container. And in this big container right here, you will see it on the video screen eventually. Well, I should step on the table. Um, we will do a color change. And you will see in a very big volume, you, you will have all kinds of artifacts. I hope you can see it. It's a blue dye. It's actually a pH indicator that we have poured in. And you see clouds there. So basically what you see is if you have very big systems and mix, then we have heavy convection. And this convection, you see now pH change, but you see that it takes uh, some time. It's not really homogeneous. But <laughs> if, we, if we needed a journal for this kind of publication, we would definitely choose the journal of unreproducible results. <laughs> um, it is very difficult to describe. And let's move now to a second experiment, which will involve a slightly smaller object, which is the one there. And we will actually do the same. So, see the blue color, and you see that it fills due to convection down to a certain level, and then the convection is stopped there. And if you change the pH, the pH is changed down to about the same level. And interestingly enough, all the rest of mixing is left, in this case, to diffusion, and diffusion is uh, very, very slow still at that scale. So, the second one on the left-hand side is actually an experiment we started yesterday. And uh, you see that diffusion has proceeded over the 24 hours, but not very much. And we, we actually can leave this, uh, this here, we, we, we can leave this on the, on the table here, such that at the end of the show you will see that not much has changed. So actually, this is a very characteristic thing of volumes, that in bigger volumes we have predominantly convection and in smaller volumes we will have more diffusion. Could we go to the next step? So we basically connect now to the microscope and we'll see hopefully a smaller volume. Uh, it's, it's actually quite difficult to show a very nice, intense color reaction on the small scale because the absorbance is not very good anymore. We have loads of refractions. with experiments, you know. Small volumes need more time for the preparation of the number. <laughs>
Yeah. Okay, could we in the meantime switch to the third experiment? Uh, we let him play for a moment. We'll have another experiment here. Uh, we will run a slack gel electrophoresis. That means we will have a uh, separation of ions in the electric field. And uh, I think we should. I'm trying to show you that, and uh, actually we will come to electrophoresis later on, but this type of electrophoresis here is slow enough that I have to start it now such that we see a separation at the end of my talk. And uh, <coughs> So basically what you see here is a picture of this uh, flat gel electrophoresis instrument. So basically, this is a water pump with one electrode. There is a second water pond on top there. Uh, both are filled with water. We apply a voltage basically from this area to that area. And there is very similar to thin layer chromatography. There is a plate which stands upright. So you basically see the rectangular glass plate here. And between the two glass plates, there is a gel. Uh, filled and what Martin is doing is he basically injects samples up into some holes that were left in the gel. After that we will close the instrument for safety reasons and we will start running it. And uh, I don't tell you what we'll see. Actually move a little closer to it. So we will put the cap over top of it that connects the electrodes. So basically, did you inject in every, in every place? But basically, in each one of those of those places up there, there is uh, a mixture of of, of uh, dyes, and we have turned on the voltage. I hope it's the right way around, uh, otherwise they would just migrate up. <laughs> and uh, we could actually leave that going. Believe me that we leave it going, because I will take the video picture off now. And we basically have a look at it later on. So I just leave it sit there, still. Um, okay. Let's go to those slides. <coughs> yep, excellent. It's easier than experiments to get slide. <laughs> so, if you look at volumes, experimentally, what you have seen here, we handled uh, basically several liters, uh, maybe 50 milliliters. We tried to handle uh, a milliliter under the microscope. But uh, a nanoliter is definitely getting very difficult to handle. What is a nanoliter? It's a cube with a 100 micron uh, length. We will have in a one micromolar solution uh, about one femtomole in that volume. That means on the order of 600 million molecules. That means far too many. And we may raise the question, is it necessary to have so many? Uh, this looks like this volume for that concentration is still too big, in fact. Because to, to do good statistics, maybe we only need 10,000 molecules. Diffusion time across this cube is 10 seconds. So it's no wonder that in our case, where we had larger volumes, 24 hours would do only very little to diffusion. Um, they have a large surface area. And we can integrate very many volumes per square centimeter. It's actually 2,500. And if you look at the information density, basically we take the diffusion time for a reaction time and multiply it by the number of volumes we have on a square centimeter to obtain an information density of 250 diffusion control reactions per uh, second and square centimeter. 
Now, let's go one step further down to a cube that is 10 micron size. This we can definitely not handle manually very easily. I will show you ways to handle that. This is a picoliter. One micromolar solution at this point means one atomole or 600,000 molecules. Please note that the diffusion time across the cube is 100 milliseconds now. That means uh, diffusion controlled reactions should go very fast. We have large surface areas. If we needed them, we can arrange 250,000 volumes on a square centimeter. And the information density went up tremendously to 2.5 million diffusion controlled reactions per second and square centimeter. And somehow, this seems uh, very compatible with what uh, combinatorial chemistry or high throughput screening is going for. But I'll come back to that at the end of my talk. Uh, I was speaking about those sort of closed volumes. But of course there is uh, capillaries as well. We could define borderlines by diffusion eventually if you are fast enough. Or we could go another step further and define volume elements if you look at them very short time, they will keep its shape quite nicely. Today I will basically show you examples from those two areas. And uh, the first area actually is very well known. The most well known example is microwell plates. Very famous in high throughput screening. People would, uh, to, to some extent, tend to collect those items in thousands of exemplars and they store their libraries of compounds in those plates. Uh, we all know that there has been attempts to find alternatives to them and uh, one attempt is given on the next slide which is the approach that Affimax, later Affimetrix in California is going basically using the surface of a silicon chip and by photolithography defining different chemistries on each different area. So each rectangle here is the surface area of 50 by 50 micron. What you see here is a synthesis of, I think, 400 oligonucleotides and the binding assay. And you see the, the result of the binding in specific areas. You can then evaluate these kind of patterns. <coughs> now, you can make microwell plates in a, in a different way. This approach uh, was published by Fuhr in Germany. Uh, he used high frequency field on electrodes. This is actually a chip version already. You see uh, 100 micron is this much. He could trap latex beads like that. You could actually induce the flow in the water and still you would keep these beads very nicely in position. But you don't need a beaker. You just need those electrodes. Now, what else do we have? We were speaking about capillaries, and uh, I have here a bunch of them, very nicely arranged by a Japanese company. <coughs> capillaries can be used as chemical reactors as well. They can be used for separations, but actually mix and separate is just the reverse of each other. Uh, I will show you a couple of examples from that domain, capillary domain. This was actually a part of a DNA sequencer. Um, let's look what we have. In flow systems, we could have capillary arranged that go into different levels. So basically what we have here is a whole bunch of chips. It's about 12 silicon chips down here. Pump one, two, three, four. And these pumps would actually carry out a two-step chemical reaction down here, which is very old chemistry. It's a, a molybdenum blue reaction for the analysis of phosphate. And uh, you see this thumb is not the one of Gorilla or of any unnatural uh, person. This, is, uh, this was my co-worker, Siva Geiger. Um, from that, a concept evolved to use flow system. We call it microtas or miniaturized total analysis system. And we compared it to other analytical equipment that was good enough for online monitoring. We compared it to ideal sensors. I don't think it makes sense to go too much into detail here. But one thing is very interesting about miniaturization. If we shrink everything down by the same factor, and if we shrink the space in all three dimensions 
by the factor b. And if we leave time as a constant, we will, and by definition, a diameter or length of tubes, injection plug length, any optical path length in detectors, or whatever we have in terms of length, will be proportional to b. And anything linked to time, like the analysis time, cycle time, of course, a chemical reactor time, detection response time requirement would remain constant in that system. What happens to our parameters? If you look at the linear flow rate in a tube, linear flow rate is a <coughs> length divided by time. So it's basically d over a constant is d again. <coughs> so the volume would shrink by d to the third power. That means if we shrink our system by a factor 10, the linear flow rate goes down by a factor 10. The volume would go down by a factor 1,000. You will see that the pressure flow, the pressure drop for laminar flow condition remains a constant. That means this system is very good for pumped flow. Electric fields behave nicely. We don't have trouble there. Uh, what is a little bit trouble, and particularly engineers uh, would see that, that these uh, parameter-free numbers here, Reynolds number, Heckler number, and so on, I don't go into detail with them, that they uh, are not constant. They are changing up and down. And that means that we have no similar systems. And we will basically see something very similar to these pots that I've shown here, these ones that we have strange behavior. If we go from a big pot to a medium size to a small pot, we will have different behavior. This is not very nice. Of course, we don't like that. We would like to compensate for that and get into an area where we have all these figures as a constant. How do we do that? We, we simply turn around the game and define that our miniaturization should include a miniaturization of time. And this sounds very strange. So by definition, we must do everything faster. If we miniaturize by factor 10, we do it 100 times faster. And then we stay in similar systems that behave exactly the same in the big scale and the small scale. Uh, but if we shrink by factor 10, our linear flow rate must go 10 times higher. We don't gain very much in terms of volume. Our pressure will rise dramatically. That means in high pressure systems, we can forget miniaturization, basically. In electro-driven system, uh, the voltage, for example, is a constant, so it's wonderful. We should miniaturize electro-driven system, and I'm sure Norman will agree with that. He's sitting right there and smiling. I see he is agreeing. Um, should I use the camera, Norman? No. <laughs> and uh, what you see is that all the, all the different parameters that describe the behavior of our material in the system remains a constant. So basically, if we have a published person, uh, one of those drugs or rats or whatever, uh, we can shrink it. If we follow these simple rules up there, then we are on the good side. Um, let's jump into the technology. I'll quickly browse through a couple of pictures. This is a very early one, using microfabrication techniques for uh, Actually, a gas chromatograph. It was done at Stanford, published in 1979. It was Stephen Terry, who still is working in the area. Um, this was a full silicon wafer. It's a planar monocrystal, polished, and then channels etched into it, including holes that were etched into it. So basically, this is an injective area. On the back side, there is a rotary valve. You see a long channel. And in this location, there was a second chip mounted for thermal conductivity detection. Now, the process is very simple. Um, we basically start with a flat, uh, flat piece of silicon, go through a couple of coating steps, and then we use a photo mask to shine onto the substrate. And whatever our photo mask defines in two dimension will be machined into that structure. In this example, it's a very simple channel, but we can be, go very complicated, in fact, at the same cost as a simple layout. And at the end, we will have our structured wafer. This is a one last process. Uh, I think the Pentium processor needs definitely uh, more than a dozen masks, so it's a lot more complicated than this. The product of an etched silicon can look like this. And it's quite nice actually for a crystallographer because uh, the flat surface is the 100 plane and you see some planes of the crystal that show up if we uh, etch properly. 
So this is edging channels. There is, of course, other things we could do. Actually, the, the chip I've just shown, I brought it with me, and I will quickly show you the overhead. This is a tool wafer. The wafer is about uh, small, it's a little bit smaller than I have, and it looks like that. Those were the microstructures that actually I've shown on the electron microscope. So you see the tiny little areas here are three by three millimeter items. <coughs> now, um, there is other possibilities. We can put layers down, one layer on top of the other. This is layer one, two, three, uh, a sacrificial layer four, sacrificial layer five, and this is basically a transformer on a chip. We can put layers down in the way that we get bimetals. That means if you apply a current to a bimetal, it will bend. And you see a couple of those tools down here. So there is really, really uh, loads of toys around. We can use sacrificial layer technology, which means that we have the uh, silicon surface here, and we deposit a layer which actually was underneath this plate here, but it has been removed by etching afterwards to free up this plate. That you can then free up all these plates. Uh, if they are connected to each other by hinges, you can fold them up, flip them together. Uh, there is actually quite nice micro-optical benches available in quite small areas. Look at the size. This, is, this whole thing, this mirror here, is smaller than a, my, uh, a millimeter cube. Let's go now into an electrophoresis experiment. That's basically uh, something very similar as this experiment that we started there. Um, to make it simple, we connect two electrolyte buffer reservoirs by capillary or by a gel. In that case, it was a gel. In this case, it's capillary. And we will find that ions move. And the small ions move according to their charge. This is phenomenon of electrophoresis. And uh, the efficiency of a separation is given in plate numbers, and plate numbers actually are kind of uh, equivalent to extraction experiments. So a plate, one plate, one theoretical plate means one extraction equilibrium. Uh, liquid chromatography typically is in the hundreds, two thousands, or ten thousands. Capillary electrophoresis is supposed to be higher. And, uh, this parameter is proportional to the length of the capillary divided by the diameter. So it's particularly simple in the case of electrophoresis. And please note that this is again a proportionality. So if we want to improve this, we can either take a long capillary or we can take a small diameter capillary. We have two possibilities. Now we have to pay for this efficiency as you pay for a car. Uh, and we pay in terms of analysis time. The minimum analysis time is proportional to the length multiplied by the diameter. So if we wanted to increase the efficiency by increasing the length of the system, we will pay by a long time. And this long time means actually something that we know from everyday life. If you wanted to buy the new Jaguar, then you have to pay a lot of money for efficiency. If we increase efficiency by miniaturizing, we don't pay because if we shrink D, our time would be shorter and at the same time we should be more efficient. That means we, we have found a way here to get our Jaguar for free. Isn't it wonderful? I tell you where, but not in this talk. Um, and we have actually tried to prove this by uh, <coughs> making a, a simple glass microstructure with a channel on it with different holes that we could connect. So basically a sample would go in there by applying voltage from 1 to 4. We introduce 100 picoliters of sample into the capillary. Then we have a maximum of 5 centimeter of the capillary for the separation. And uh, actually this is a photograph of the device and uh, I have brought this exact device with me. I hope it looks somehow similar to the photograph. Let's try that out. Uh, you don't see it as clearly as a photograph, and it's actually the wrong way around. This is it. So basically a very simple structure, and what you can see on it is that we have these kind of reservoirs, pipette tips, just glued into the holes, 
which is uh, very much the solution of, uh, of a research person. It's of course not uh, very foolproof. Uh, if we look at details on the structure, uh, you see the channels etched into the glass. This injection volume here is 100 picolitres, so we are actually down in the area of volumes uh, that we wanted for high efficiencies. In this case, we wanted to do a separation. Uh, we did not want to do uh, a chemical reaction, but of course, we could do that. For the separation, you can see that the time, the time scales are very fast. So, 14 seconds for this separation. If we had 14 seconds for the separation right here on this table, it would already be completely out at the other end, but I will assure you that the peaks would still be there at the end of my talk. So, 14 seconds is really a lot faster. This is just amino acids. Um, chemical reactions. This is one example which is very simple, which is a labeling uh, of primary amines, uh, amino acids actually, with portofdaldialdehyde, OPA. This reaction goes very fast. We have allowed from this point to the point of detection about one second in time, and we see that amino acids that were not labeled previously would show up nicely. We don't know anything about the yield of these reactions, but uh, we got enough product to be able to detect where these components are. And I think this kind of scheme would be very interesting to follow up on the synthetic side. Gel electrophoresis for DNA, this is an example where we have injected uh, loads of samples. This is about a quarter of an hour. If we pick up one of these uh, peaks here, then we find that it has a fine structure and it is actually phosphorothioates, uh, PDT 10 to 25 which means it is 10 to 25 bases long. And uh, I, I don't do it now, but you can count 10, 11, 12, 13, and so on. You can count the peaks, and you'll find that they're basically all there. <clears throat> the relative broadness of the peaks is due to the fact that in phosphorothioates, every, uh, we have uh, one chirality center, center per base introduced. That means we actually have mixtures that we can't separate. Now, something that eventually, uh, physicists would like. I mean, in high energy physics there is linear accelerators and there is uh, synchrotrons. So why shouldn't we try to do electrophoresis around in a circle? Because this would set the separation, then there is the end. Why should we do it around the circle? And uh, if we briefly look into this structure, which is not the circle but the square connected. We can inject the sample here, start the separation by applying a voltage from here to there, and then move on. So our three components move on, and we decide that we synchronize on component two. That means at this point, after one quarter of the circumference, we switch a voltage to this, the diagonal, and like in an electromotor, we go on, switch from this to that pole, this to that, so we just go on switching the voltages around in a circle. What do we get? If we have just one component and look at one point on the circle, uh, we see shortly after the injection, we see fluorescing here. After one cycle, two cycle, three, four, five, every cycle we can recover fluorescing. That's not too interesting besides the fact that we got a very high efficiency with only two kilowatts. Uh, what is more interesting is if we apply a mixture, and this is amino acid mixture here, so basically it's glycine, serine, aspergine, phenylalanine here in this first peak, there is FITC, and uh, in this peak, arginine here comes as an artifact, we don't see that in the first place, but this peak group here with the four amino acids shows up after one cycle. It shows up again, but nicely separated here, you clearly see the four peaks, and then we eliminate the outer, the peak on the left and on the right. Here you see basically the two center peak, a little bit of the one on the right, and at the end we have isolated pure aspergine. And this takes 350 seconds. So it's a fairly rapid process, and the device to do it is fairly simple. It's a piece of glass, a couple of electrodes, uh, optics, and a photomultiplier. And of course, we need some voltage to drive Now, I wanted to show you actually uh, some sections of video.
Well, Chairman, how much time do you give me, actually? You've got plenty left. Okay, I could show one, one tip then. <laughs> Let's try the microscope again. If it, if it works this time, we can quickly try that out. Because I could show one of the devices on the microscope. don't see anything then there must be something <coughs> demonstration effect that is well known and uh, the only way to overcome is, is to actually have a glass of champagne or beer or so and uh, go back and cry. Um, we'd better stop that. Um, I tried to show you then a short section, uh, actually three short sections of video. One is showing you an experiment of doing electrophoresis on a chip. <coughs> And uh, yeah, this is it. Basically, you see the analyte in here. You see buffer reservoirs out there. This is a waste container. And we have a channel system that connects the three, plus a meandering channel that goes down this way. Um, I've taken this tape from uh, Mike Ramsey from Oak Ridge National Lab. He had a very nice setup to, to, to do this. But in fact, we've done very similar experiments. Uh, very shortly you will see the same thing on the fluorescence conditions. At the moment we have conventional light. Actually it's a piece of glass and the, the, the dark spots out here are pieces of tubing that are glued on top of the chip. Maybe it's a plain, plane. Probably be it. <coughs> okay. So, uh, Basically, under fluorescence conditions, it's supposed to. Yeah. Now you see under fluorescence condition, you see the mixture coming in by just simply applying voltage from this electrode to the electrode over there. You see some of it go to waste, and you see a tiny little plug sitting there and waiting over time. We don't have diffusion because we have a counterflow from this and that capillary into it and diluting basically the sample stream down there to keep the diffusion layer in steady state conditions. And after a short moment, we will uh, basically see the sample go. And you see that there is two dyes in it. One is fluorescing, the other must be rhodamine or something like that. And you see that they migrate at different speeds. This is electrophoresis. You see how fast they separate. It only takes a few seconds to take small ions of different charges apart. And this is really only possible on uh, relatively small systems. On big systems, you would need uh, more time for the whole thing. Um, if we go to even smaller systems, and this is basically the same, we have the analyte down here, move it up into the waste container. We have a buffer coming from the left that takes a very tiny sample in this case, it must be on the order of 20 picoliters or so, into the separation column, this will, will go even faster. And you will soon see that in the fluorescence mode, you'll see the same separation actually now that in real time, this is a real time separation, and it goes pretty fast because we have a relatively high voltage we can apply to those small systems. So the smaller the system, actually, the higher the voltage we can apply to it uh, until we have some materials break down. So I'll stop this video now. And, uh, could I please have the second video? The, what you will see on the second video is something very similar. 
starting from this simple experiment, we, we looked into parallel processing. Uh, and we actually wanted to, to try to, to, to get to a serial to parallel converter very similar to, to data processing. Okay. And uh, on a second take, you will see a similar setup. You see an introduction channel and uh, parallel processing. So basically, we have introduced in this case just one component. It's just fluorescing. It's uh, actually brand new data. And you will see it go to the right. It is real-time conditions. You see 44 parallel channels that at this moment are supposed to do exactly the same. You see that they don't. That will give us some work for tomorrow. It will motivate my students. And uh, you will see that we can keep actually all the clocks quite nicely defined. They're all pretty much the same in terms of size and concentration. This is a different layout that does the same. Basically, we introduce the sample this way, and you see the peaks go. It's just one component in this case. It's real time again. You see, we remove the rest. We get new sampling, and we do parallel operation. Please note that this thing needs only four electrodes. Basically, one up here, one down there, one on the left, and one on the right side. So it's a very simple system to do parallel processing. Um, of course, this is just a very early stage of a real <coughs> microprocessor. <coughs> we would need much more complication, but I'm pretty sure in electronics <coughs> the whole development would start very simple as well. And we have to go from simple to more complicated. And you see how nicely in parallel these individual clocks would migrate in these cases. So we basically could have different samples introduced one after the other here, <coughs> and then we could run even different analysis with that. This is a more close-up view of the whole thing. I'll just show you one shot. This is real time. It goes really very quickly. Be aware that one clock that is injected here is on the order of one femtomo of fluorescein that you see here. I will stop this and uh, I'll ask for the next videotape. The last one which I've borrowed actually from Princeton University. People have told me that uh, chemistry is a dead, uh, deals with dead matter. Biology is very nice because you have live animals. I'll prove you the contrary. I'll prove you the contrary. What you will see in this video, actually, before I start it, what you will see in this video is lambda DNA, and you will see how lambda DNA moves on a microfabricated array of pillars on, uh, in an electric field. And you have to believe me that what you see is individual molecules. It's lambda DNA. Uh, that has about uh, 20,000 base pairs. So you see the individual molecules, some of them are stretched very long ways, some others are uh, in, a globe, in, a, in another shape. You see some of them are uh, getting trapped, like this one, and would slowly take this portion back and then start migrating. And uh, I really like these kind of pictures. This looks like we have worms or any other animal. So isn't this a proof that chemistry really is almost life? Okay, I think it's time now to stop and to have a quick look at our electrophoresis experiment that we started here. further down here, this line. It's a bit unfortunate because there is in the instrumentation, there is some uh, black object there. Basically, uh, in all the time that I was talking, and I talked very, very long, didn't I? <laughs> um, 
And these compounds will migrate down to this spot and to that spot. So basically you'll get the same type of separation as you've seen on the video. And both experiments were real time. Keep that in mind. And this is only due, uh, possible because we go to small sizes. Um, yeah. Let me then basically finish with uh, the last few thoughts about our microprocessor idea. What does biology say to the whole thing? <coughs> it is no wonder. Biology had millions and billions of years to optimize. It's no wonder that they came up with cells, and prokaryotic cells is actually bacteria cells, uh, that are on the order of a couple of microns long, and maybe half a micron to one micron wide. Because this is the best possible chemical reactor. Diffusion is extremely fast in here, and even large molecules diffuse readily across. If we look at the head of the department, or anybody else in this audience, then we will find that larger organisms have a well-organized transport system. Otherwise, they couldn't work. I mean, if you had uh, something like this pop here, you know, that would uh, just fluctuate a little bit and would not be in well-defined conditions, you would hardly ever make an organism function. And the uh, biology textbook tells me that these cells are <coughs> slightly larger than the bacteria, but not very much. They are still in the range of a couple of microns by a couple of microns. They have organelles and particularly the Golgi vesicles, vesicles uh, uh, endoplasmatic reticulum, mitochondrium and so on. They are wonderful, wonderful synthesizers for chemistry. Um, there is neurons, you may say. Neurons that start in the brain and end up down in the leg. Um, I didn't bring a slide of those. This was too long a slide, <laughs> but uh, there is very nice, very nice transport mechanisms actually that nature has. There is tubulins, alpha tubulins, beta tubulins, that would self-assemble to make 24 nanometer diameter tubes, uh, and they would just grow into any length. And what is even more fascinating. <clears throat> It is a motion thing. It's like a highway, a biochemical highway. So basically, if you have kinase in here attached to a vesicle, then we found that vesicles that hardly would diffuse would rapidly move into this direction. So we have basically a motor, a molecular motor that moves alongside the protein. We can do the opposite experiment. I mean, I haven't done it, but I have it from publications. Uh, if we immobilize the kinase in, to a glass plate, we can make the microtubules moving. So this both proves that we have perfect systems in nature that we haven't used yet on our microsystems. So there is a lot, a lot more to, to do, I can tell you. Um, there is an application, actually, and eventually my sponsors would like to hear that. Keyword, it's a buzzword. Combinatorial chemistry. Uh, this little... Uh, Rectangle up here is actually the synthetic chemist. Does a wonderful job there. Producing 10,000 products of AB from 100 FFC, 100 FFC there, or even worse, millions of products. Um, then there is other wonderful people in the pharmaceutical industry, which are quality control, electrical chemists, for example. There are biologists there. And these poor guys would have to interface to that. And this interface is basically down in the corridor between the labs. Is that correct? Is that the best way to do it? I mean, how do you operate a PC in your office if you, if you wanted to, to, to get the square root of 7? Do you have to, de to deal with the digital code? Do you have to, to, to carry it along the corridor to get the answer over there? No, of course not. Of course not. We should connect it. We should really, really uh, think about a chemical microprocessor. Tony and I have already created a buzzword for it, microsynthesis, synthesis, total analysis system, which would basically do some combinatorial chemistry, and in the same neighborhood, we would do quality control and bioassays on that. 
but this would need a new concept. And I don't have that concept now, uh, but very schematically, an element of that concept would look like that. But we basically have a microsynthesis, the most simple one. We feed edact A, edact B in it. We have a specific reaction, specific bioassay, and at the end there is one bit that tells us is this a hit? Yes or no? That's all. It could be very small because we are only seeking the answer. This has no reason to be big, and this is basically my conclusion. Whatever needs to be big will remain big. Could be the pockets of public funding or pockets of pharmaceutical industry or whatever you think. All the rest will be very small. I leave the exact interpretation up to you. Um, at the end, it is my pleasure to acknowledge, in particular, the main sponsors of the center, Swiss by Beecham and Zeneca. I would like to acknowledge the people who helped me with the experiments, Martin Kopp, Jan Eichel, John Crabtree, Jan Liedema, Simon Turner, Chris Howard. I'd like to uh, thank the people that were in my former CIVAG IG group, Sebek van Porte, Norbert Burggraf, Karl Reffenhaus and Franz van Heeren. And I've borrowed uh, a tape, a section of tape from Mike Ramsey at Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, the middle part of the tape was done in a collaboration with Luke Bruce and Wally Pars at Calibre in Palo Alto. And the last part, the, DNA, the walking DNA, was uh, taken by Bob Austin in Princeton. And I acknowledge, besides Ms. Van Beecham and Zeneca, some funding from BBSRC, BBSRC, Lab of the Government Chemist, and some previous work, this work up here, basically funded by Supergeigi, Measurement and Testing, uh, and two Swiss Science Foundations. Thank you very much for your attention.